Okay, hi everyone. Uh, we are Fidelity International. It's great to be speaking to you on today's call. We will let the numbers trickle up slowly and whilst we're waiting for people to come in, uh, let's introduce everyone who's going to be speaking today. So I'm Serena Vaughan. I am a member of the Fidelity Early Careers team. I am our Attraction, Diversity and Engagement Manager. So it means that I look at everything we do early careers through a DNI lens. So how can we make sure that we are bringing on a really diverse group of people people, diverse in experience, diverse in thinking. Um, and also I look at outreach uh, events, employer brand, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so it's really, really great to have so many of you signed up. Um, and we're looking at we're looking forward to talking to you about opportunities beyond investment management at Fidelity International. Um, all right, I'll go through who's on my screen. So Stephen, do you want to give a short intro next? Hello, my name's uh, Steve Gardner. I am digital editor in the editorial team at Fidelity, my team makes uh, podcasts, videos, long reads, infographics, all that kind of stuff um, targeted at professional investors and predominantly Fidelity's clients. Perfect. Thank you. And you'll hear much more about his role later, as you will everyone on the call. James, do you want to give a short introduction? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so James Leach, I'm Senior Proposition Manager in a team called Rapid Product Development. Um, we are sort of quite forward looking, um, doing a lot of kind of regulatory um, scanning of how our kind of wider industry and finance in general is going to be disrupted over the kind of coming years um, and what sort of products and services we can kind of, I suppose, start looking and be focusing on now um, in order to meet that kind of evolving, changing future. brilliant summary. Tanya? Hi everybody, uh, my name is Tanya White. I uh, look after the UK retail product team um, in a similar area actually to James. Um, my team um, develop and also manage our existing products on what we call our retail platform. So we look after um, personal investors but also um, advisors and um, their end customers as well and we manage products such as ISAs um, and um, self-invested personal pensions and general investment accounts as well as cash. Brilliant. Okay. Fantastic. And Emily, lastly over to you. Hi everyone, um, I'm Emily Havers. Um, so I'm a former graduate and now I work as a project manager in the Global Board Leadership Team um, in our workplace investing area. So effectively what my team does is we conduct research on employees and employers around kind of retirement sentiment and people's emotions towards their finances um, and their general well-being that then kind of we report back to our big clients so that they can have a bit more awareness about what their employees are feeling and where their trajectories are for the next few years. Fantastic. And we'll grab the slides up now and begin the proper webinar. Um, but I think you can all see that just from the short introductions of everyone on the call, there are clearly opportunities beyond investment management at Fidelity International. And you will hear a lot more about the career journeys and paths of our speakers today. Um, but what we're really aiming to get across to you is that if you're interested in investment management, there is more than one route into the industry. And there's some really cool jobs that you've probably just not heard of. So if we put the slides up, then I am ready to begin. Fantastic. So the first thing I want to get across to you, of course, I am the early careers manager so i want you to know about our early careers opportunities at fidelity international if you finish today's call and you think do you know what uh, a career in asset management might be something that i could do and it's not something that i previously considered then we do have open opportunities at the moment so i want to be really clear that our investment management graduate and summer internship roles have already closed for applications however as you're going to know from the end of today's call, there are so many opportunities beyond investment management. So there's still time to apply for our business management graduate and summer internship programs, our sales and marketing summer internship, our sustainable investing roles, our general counsel roles, as well as technology industrial placements and spring insight programs. So today's webinar will mostly focus on career paths related to our business management and sales and marketing programs. Um, but I really do want to encourage you to take a look at all the opportunities we have open and available. 
a very quick bit on our application process because I know we get this question a lot. Um, but there are four stages. So one is an online application and uh, CV. We don't believe in cover letters. Uh, the second stage is Explore Fidelity, which is an online strengths-based questionnaire, essentially, comprising of 32 cognitive, behavioral, and situational judgment type questions. If you then pass Explore Fidelity, you'll be invited to Life at Fidelity, which is an online video interview. Again, very strengths-based questions, and there are five of them. And then if you pass Life at Fidelity, you may be invited to a virtual assessment center. Uh, again, there's a strengths-based interview and then either a case study for our non-investment roles or perhaps a technical exercise if you were going for an investment role. Um, all in all, it probably takes about two hours total up until stage four and you don't have to complete all of that on the same day. The online application form is very quick uh, and the two assessments probably take between 45 and 50 minutes for most candidates to complete. However, if you're interested in applying, I would recommend that you do that as soon as possible to leave yourself time to finish these uh, assessments. So key things to know before I move on to everyone else. Uh, for all of our programs, you do not need to be studying anything finance related. We welcome applicants from all degree disciplines and you will see people from all degree backgrounds and there are no grade requirements. Um, please, again, apply as soon as possible to ensure you have time to complete the assessments ahead of the deadline and email us if you have any individual questions about eligibility. I also very quickly want to mention before we move on to the main webinar that as an early careers team, we have been running webinars from September, uh, continuing on into the new year. We've com recently completed a finance for non-finance webinar series where we went through demystifying financial markets and opportunities across investment management for those of you that don't have a finance background. We've also done skills webinars, which aim at boosting your interview skills, uh, understanding strengths-based processes and how to identify your strengths and how you can approach the assessment center. And we've also We've done very detailed business area introductions for each of our program areas, including business management and sales and marketing, uh, where in depth we've covered the structure at Fidelity, the types of teams you might go into, and a much more practical look uh, at what you need to know to go through our assessment process. So you do not require any technical knowledge, you do not require any specific finance experience, but if you want to watch any of these webinars back and support your application, please do email us with the email address on the screen and we're very happy to send over the recording to you. Uh, there will be time for questions and answers at the end of today's session, so please do use the question box and the chat box and then we can have a look at what you really want to say. Okay, so from there I'm going to move on to Tanya to talk a little bit about her career journey. Thanks very much, Jelena, um, and it's lovely to be here to talk to you all today. Um, so, I have been at Fidelity pretty much um, my entire career, so um, I joined Fidelity pretty much straight out of university, did a couple of you know, um, jobs before I, I actually joined Fidelity um, back in 1998. Um, can move to the next slide, just so you can start to talk through, thank you very much. Um, so. I am, um, as I said, based in, in London, Surrey, um, and also home worker, as you can see from today. Oh gosh, I can't, I'm going to have to go on to my one. Oh, there we go. Um, and um, I've had quite a varied, um, varied uh, career at Fidelity. Um, I started off um, in operations, um, where I moved from um, becoming an associate to an assistant manager, and, and that was really. Um, I studied economics and German at university. And I actually joined um, uh, what's called our European Service Centre at the time. Um, so we processed a lot of, um, of applications and um, instructions and dealing instructions from um, our European customers um, outside of the UK and into our offshore fund range. Um, and really kind of progressed um, through there from associate to um, assistant manager within that within that time. Um, I also got to travel a lot to our kind of other European offices in so Luxembourg and um, spent a couple of weeks there kind of, um, working in there in our German office in Frankfurt as well. Um, I then moved on to become a business change and um, project manager and that really gave me a really great insight into the whole business actually. So not just kind of the retail business where I work um, but um, Losing my not just the retail business where I work, but also um, into the entire um, into the entire um, uh, into the entire um, operation or entire business. So we worked with our kind of institutional um, 
colleagues. We worked with um, our investment management business, um, and we worked with um, you know, an off fund managers to kind of launch products, to manage products, um, we looked at kind of risks, um, and kind of different um, work. Be able to work with different. Um, different departments to be able to do that. So it gave me a great opportunity to understand a lot more about um, Fidelity, a lot more about the different opportunities um, within the organization, um, and also to improve my network as well. Um, from there, I moved on to our um, advised business, uh, now called Fidelity Advisor Solutions, and I worked um, within business operations um, there. So I supported our marketing teams and our um, advise sales teams um, with any operational um, issues. Um, so what might be the back office queries that um, advisors have where they want to actually kind of push their instructions straight through to our to us um, to understand kind of how they worked, what they needed to be able to improve the way that they operated. Um, I met with a lot of um, with a lot of advisors, understood their business, um, how they interacted with us, which then obviously helped us to, to build better products to be able to play with them. Um, after a maternity leave, I then um, went back to work in a similar role, but in within person investing. So our, our part of the business where we worked um, directly with clients, what we call business to clients, and um, really kind of understanding a lot more about our investor needs, um, guidance that they may need, um, and just really supporting, again, the marketing teams and also our client, um, client service team for our phone teams in terms of what they wanted. Uh, again, after another maternity leave, I then returned to business change, and I actually went to a role there where we were replatforming our business. So we were moving from one operating system to another, which was a really multi-year program. And again, I got to have a different experience. We moved into offering um, shares, so shares in the stock market to our, our retail investors, which we hadn't done before. It's a completely different um, side of the business I'd ever worked on, so it gave me really great exposure to understand exactly kind of what that entailed um, and the different ways that um, working with different kind of third parties that we worked with there as well. Um, from there, um, I was able to um, move on to another kind of part of the business that we actually um, started to um, start to look at. So we have a, a US um, kind of sister company, and we were liaising with them um, to start a business um, which supported employers who wanted to compensate their employees by offering them shares. Um, and so we were um, providing the brokerage part of that business. So I moved from my business manager role to become a product owner within within there, and I was able to work with our colleagues both in here in India and also um, in the US. Got to travel quite a lot with that one um, to our various offices over in um, in Boston and um, in different parts of the country, which was which was fantastic. So, kind of, I've had quite a, a varied career. Although I've only um, worked ever worked at Fidelity, and um, obviously really enjoy it, um, love the people. Um, but I've also been had the opportunity to work in a lot of different parts of our retail business as well, build a really great network, um, and also understand kind of a lot more about um, the business and how it operates. Go to the next slide. So, my role. Um, so, I um, run, um, or I'm responsible for a number of product owners within my team. As I mentioned before, um, we are developing new products on the retail platform, um, as well as um, managing our existing uh, products, such as our ISAs um, and LISA investment accounts and cash, um, and supporting our retail business channels, our uh, personal investing channels, so offering. Um, products directly to the customer, our advice solution um, channel, and then also our workplace investment channel as well that offers um, workplace products um, to um, employers and their employees. Um, so I run a number of product owners. We develop new products, as I mentioned, but we also have to manage those products. And that therefore means that we have to understand um, how the products run, um, all the any regulatory implications of those products as well. We have to run annual product reviews. We have to understand all of our customer feedback. We do customer testing when we're um, when we're launching new new products as well. Um, we also take customer feedback. Um, we manage and prioritise the backlog um, and work with our. Um, the different business channels in order to, to prioritise and maintain those. We have relationship management as well with with different third parties. 
Um, and we also support the management of cash on the platform, again, kind of managing our underlying invest um, cash that we hold and face with, um, with our different banks. From a key stakeholder's perspective, um, from an internal perspective, uh, we work very closely with propositions um, to be able to obviously realise their business goals. We work closely with the sales team to understand what they require and um, also feedback as well. We work obviously with operations in terms of being able to support um, the processing of our products and also client services who actually talk to our customers and get fantastic feedback. Um, we listen in as well to calls to understand exactly what kind of issues or challenges our, our clients are facing and especially kind of work in terms of vulnerable customers as well. We work closely with our technology and um, colleagues as well in terms of developing our, um, our platform and then from a general um, council perspective, so both people like uh, compliance, legal, risk, etc., to obviously make sure that we're running our product appropriately or developing appropriately and then third party vendors, party vendors and um, partners as well. A typical day for me um, typically starts at 8 o'clock, especially this time of year where we work with India and the clocks go back for us but not for them so uh, so they their working day finishes slightly early for us so I like to get a, an early um, an early start with them and um, I do weekly one-to-ones with my team so I typically have at least one of those per day I would attend maybe a steering committee of one of the products where I'm maybe a council executive and responsible for the development of, of that product or where one of my team is um, we also have different channel meetings so I'll, I'll maybe meet with a the propositional um, head from um, from our personal investment team or a, a buying solutions team. Um, also stakeholder meetings, so I meet a lot with technology, with compliance, with legal, with risk, and so lots of different meetings um, to make sure that communication um, is, is works really well with all of the, my internal stakeholders and that uh, they understand what we're doing and, and what we're trying to achieve and then vice versa and we understand any issues and we can collaborate and work closely to make sure they're resolved. Um, I have typically have a team meeting as well once a week and I also have a senior leadership um, team meeting as well um, with, with, um, with the other um, kind of uh, directors within my um, within my area and then finally I'll uh, catch up and actually come do the actions from meetings and then catch up on meeting um, emails probably towards the end of the day or any breaks I have in the day as well. So, um, um, I actually I participate in a lot of those kind of virtual and assessment centres that uh, Serena talked about and, um, and also we have a lot of graduates that come through and do some of the rotations within our team as well which I really really enjoy. Um, my top tip is, is really just bring your, your whole self um, to an interview. We really strive for diversity of thought um, so we really enjoy kind of understanding how different people think and, and what they can bring to our business. I lead our social ability um, strand as well within the organization and um, so really striving to get a lot of diverse um, a lot of diverse talent into our organization um, confidence enthusiastic and small and obviously that comes in in lots of different ways um, it's really just making sure that you're attentive and that you're listening and, and that um, you really kind of uh, really want it to work for certainty and that's what I mean by, by that. And finally, research. I can't tell you the number of people that I've spoken to who know n nothing about our organisation or <laughs> what we do. And I'm sure that wouldn't be any of you, but um, really um, yeah, just make sure that, um, that you do research. I think my camera's gone off again. Um, apologies for that. Um, but uh, that is the end of, of my talk. Thank you very much, Tanya. And Tanya will be here to answer your questions. So do feel free to pop questions in the box or in the chat. Um, these, I'm sure Tanya is happy to answer pretty much every, everything and anything. So whether that's more questions about her role, more questions about her career journey, more questions about her top tips, it's absolutely fine. Um, but thank you very much. And I'm sure you can see just from our first speaker that Tanya's had a super varied career and done loads of different things. And as you all have heard then, is involved with our, our graduate program. So a really great perspective to listen to. And I'll now pass on to James. Thank you very much. Um, I think we can skip to the next slides, to be honest. Um, so as, as I kind of briefly introduced earlier, um, I'm James Leach, Senior Proposition Manager 
uh, in our rapid uh, product development team, as Tanya um, rightly said earlier, we do sit in a, a fairly similar area of the business, um, but our roles are, are different. Um, I can kind of run through um, some of my previous experience. You can see on the slide here, kind of, I suppose, really, really starting from the bottom. Um, the, the previous experience element there was actually uh, a one year um, placement year uh, at a very small, probably around kind of 30, 40 people business, um, obviously much smaller than Fidelity's kind of uh, huge size sitting sort of around sort of 10,000 employees globally. Um, so it was a completely different experience. Um, so that was in between, obviously, so I did two years at university, uh, did that role in London before going back to university to finish uh, my degree, which was banking and finance. Um, I then did actually join uh, Fidelity straight away after university onto a graduate scheme. Back then, it was called the kind of operational management grad scheme. Um, the grad schemes have gone through uh, kind of name changes and, and a few structure changes um, since then. Um, so my scheme, as you can kind of see in the, the brackets, uh, I went through five different areas. Um, that was actually six months in each. So my scheme was about two and a half years long. Um, initially starting in client services. Um, so I was speaking to um, what we would call kind of advised clients. Um, so these are people who invest their, their money or their wealth through Fidelity, um, but they typically will have an advisor on that account. Um, some advisors give uh, are kind of very engaged and, and can provide quite a kind of full on service. Some uh, don't provide sort of kind of the same level of service um, and some of them so some people kind of like to do a bit more themselves so you'd have a very wide range of clients you were talking to but it was really useful um, starting there you got a very good appreciation um, of the end customer and what their kind of um, problems were essentially um, and then obviously hopefully throughout your following two years post that initial six months um, the idea was obviously that hopefully you can kind of help to ease some of those pain points that you had had heard firsthand yourself um, for your initial kind of six months within the business. So that was a really good um, uh, kind of base, um, a baseline, to be honest, to start, because not only did you hear those pain points, but you also really got to understand Fidelity's products on a really deep level. Um, you know, you would be very comfortable talking to them with clients on a daily basis, um, numerous different calls a day. So that was a really good place to start. Um, I then moved into a team called Operational Architecture. Um, you know, teams internally change names sort of relatively frequently as their kind of scope expands, for example. Uh, but this team at the, at the time was very much um, looking at RPA, so basically ro robotic process automation. Um, and they had a lot of experts in the team in terms of how we could automate lots of our operational um, procedures and processes in order to kind of bring efficiency um, uh, through automation within those. Um, I then moved to business change. Um, technically, this, this six month rotation was kind of split into two. Um, I did it kind of around three months um, on, the, on the first half of it, focusing on GDPR. Um, so I joined that team at the time when GDPR was kind of a big topic on everybody's lips um, and we were really trying to grasp what it meant for us as a business, um, what sort of processes and procedures we might need to put in place in order to be able to deal um, with the new rights that um, customers were being given. Um, so that was a really fascinating, uh, very kind of regulatory complex project. Uh, and then the second three months within that uh, I worked on a team which basically launches new funds uh, or new share classes. So, for example, you know, we might have a client who wants to um, deposit a large amount of uh, money with us as a business, um, but they're a Swedish company, for example. And so they, they really like one investment we have, but they want it to be very precise and they want it all in Swedish krona, for example. Um, so that was the team that would kind of have to deal with all the operational side of things in terms of how we actually spin that up um, in that case. Then I moved to a team uh, called ICR, which essentially processed all of the fees that we collect as a business. So uh, as a direct customer of Fidelity for holding your account, we charge, we charge a small fee. Um, so we would uh, be processing that on a monthly basis. But also the flip side of that is, again, going back to the kind of advisor side of the business, um, essentially, an advisor is obviously charging their customers a fee in order to give advice. Um, and at the end of the day, that's pretty much the, the advisor's um, 
monthly monthly paycheck essentially so you're not just collecting fees you're you're kind of doing it on behalf of um an advisor because that's their monthly salary that they're expecting um so there are lots of kind of strict requirements i'm sure as you can imagine around that um and then finally my last rotation was in innovation um in our central innovation team which has grown uh, pretty substantially over the last few years um <clears throat> i ended up as you can see from the line above kind of jumping ahead staying there um post um that role finishing i was i was in that team for roughly around uh sort of three years to be honest um really enjoyed my time there i kind of see it as a continuation from that six month grad scheme into the following sort of two and a half years um we did a lot of work around um uh well, you kind of jump from topic to topic, um, but, you know, it was very common to be discussing things around hyper personalization or it could have been blockchain or it could have been regulatory technology. Uh, it could have been looking at what kind of uh, fintechs and new apps are out there at the moment and how are they disrupting things? What kind of things are on the horizon um, that we should be looking at and, and, and planning for and what can we start to do and potentially experiment with now? Um, depending on on the project, you know, they could last sort of three to six months um, before we would move on to kind of the next thing. Sometimes that can be working very closely with some of our internal design teams um, and the design side of the business, um, doing a lot of customer testing and research around how customers might feel about certain products and propositions. Um, and then potentially, given the, the project you're working on, uh, there might be some form of more developmental work as well. So kind of trying to bridge the gap between uh, kind of developers and what they're doing and, and the design side of things in order that we can play it back to people in the business so that it actually actually makes sense and kind of bringing it, bringing those ideas to life. Um, most recently, I've, I've moved, obviously, as you can see, in October um, to actually lead on something um, called sort of open banking, open finance. Um, that's a, product, uh, a project that I was actually working on back in the innovation team when I was a senior innovation analyst there. Um, and that's something which I've kind of moved into this new team where we're a central product team that works across uh, lots of Fidelity's different business channels um, and so head up that work there. Uh, we can go to the next slide, I think, please. Thank you. Um, and then just on this slide, um, I haven't done Tanya's kind of day in the life. I've gone for the real cliche of no day is the same, unfortunately. Um, but I've kind of broken down some of the roles within the team and key stakeholders. The roles within the team, we are a very small team. Um, so I lead on that product, as I've described. Uh, I work alongside a project manager. And we really kind of have to wear a lot of, a lot of hats, to be honest, on any given day. And we are jumping from things such as you know, looking at what regulation is coming out or what the FCA is interested in, um, what policy implications that could happen, uh, occur uh, and be inflicted, I suppose, on us, uh, what are the kind of risks and opportunities within those, um, formulating policy responses alongside our, our kind of head of policy with Infidelity, um, attending kind of industry events. And then we kind of come to the kind of medium level. Um, this is not kind of priority, but just kind of... Um, I suppose more um, sim simple, uh, detailed. Um, it's, it's all about the high, medium, or low detail. So in medium, we've kind of got what the competitors are doing in the in the landscape. Um, different companies. They could be small companies. They could be large companies. Anybody really that uh, is working in this space um, and defining what sort of products or propositions we want to be going after. Uh, and then some of the real low level detail stuff is obviously all around the internal presentations we're doing on a, on a fairly consistent basis to kind of spread uh, the, our, what we're doing in terms of our work and also where we'd like to be taking it. Um, and that includes kind of educating people uh, as well as potentially assessing and having meetings with external companies uh, who offer potential vendor solutions essentially for us. Um, and as you can see, that kind of pretty much translates over to the to the second uh, box you see on the right hand side in terms of key stakeholders. It's quite similar to I think Tanya said, so there's not too much probably to go into here around the channels, the policy teams, etc. Um, but some of the external ones are potentially interesting around speaking with different vendors, um, having conversations with the SEA. Um, they occasionally host events or policy sprints, um, which we attend. 
Um, there's the Department for Business, Energy, Industrial Strategy, which is a government department, which is looking at something we're looking at. Um, and then there's kind of uh, trade bodies and, and policy bodies uh, out there who we engage with as well on a pretty frequent basis. Um, and I don't have any more slides, but I suppose just to wrap up uh, the kind of top tips, um, I agree with obviously everything Tanya kind of put on hers. Um, but I would also say mine uh, would be the first uh, is kind of just apply. Um, because especially in our area, we find so much can just be learned uh, and so much of the knowledge that you need in order to, for example, um, succeed can, can be onboarded um, through research as well as Tanya said. Um, lots of the open banking finance stuff that we're looking at, uh, you can all learn. We're more looking for, I suppose, personalities who we think can really complement our team um, and what, what we don't kind of already have. Uh, and the second one is pretty much just say yes. Um, saying yes, especially in big companies like ours, is so valuable. Um, it can lead to new opportunities. It can lead to you building your knowledge in an area you didn't have much in before. It can lead to building your network, your understanding of how different teams in a kind of very complex uh, company interlink. Um, so that would be my, my kind of second tip. And I'll, I'll stop there and hand over to, uh, to Stephen, who I think is next. Yes, you are correct. And that was a, a great set of top tips. And again, as James can see, uh, as James said, there's an overlap between the area that he works on and Tanya works on. But you can see it's two very, very different roles within that area. Uh, and there really is a lot of variety. And now something completely different. So, Steve, take it away. Uh, thanks, Serena. Thanks. Thanks, James. So I work in the editorial team um, at Fidelity and we create multimedia stuff for predominantly um, Fidelity's professional clients to uh, read, watch, listen to, be interested in, um, find interesting and inspirational and hopefully either this month or in 10 years think now I'm going to give Fidelity a ton of money. Um, my background was not at all financial. I did do economics as part of my degree. Um, but I have to say, when I was at university, those are the lectures I was probably most likely to skip. Um, I was much more interested in, at the time, I did student radio, uh, video stuff, student newspaper. Uh, I wanted, wanted to be a journalist. And so after university, I did a broadcast journalism course at City University um, in central London. From that, I got a uh, freelance job in the ITV newsroom uh, in London. Um, and it was kind of around the time when people were, or newsrooms at least, were discovering the internet and discovering social media. And I was doing like a pretty low level shift on a weekend and someone had the... Someone had logged into the ITV News Twitter account, but thought they were logged into Twitter as themselves and weren't doing much work. And were they were looking up on the, all the monitors that we had around in the newsroom. Um, and I think there was a Nigella Lawson um, cookery program on. And they tweeted, thinking it was from themselves, Nigella Lawson is nowhere near as attractive as she thinks she is. That phrase is burnt into my, uh, into my head. Um, and then finished their shift and went off. Um, that had come from ITV News as if it was like an official pronouncement of the news. And then there was a whole load of panic while all these people who'd um, never really knew what Twitter was in 20, 2009, 2010. And then everyone kind of looked at the young kid in the backpack and were like, what do we do? <laughs> uh, and I knew how Twitter worked. Uh, helped to delete the tweet and to write the um, apology statement with the PR person um, and got offered a full-time job pretty much straight after that and continued to not tweet any insults at National Treasures um, up until now. Um, and, and I cross my fingers that that continues to be the case. Um, and I kind of worked my way up the ladder at ITV News um, where I worked with, among other people, Richard Edgar, um, who's currently Fidelity's um, editor-in-chief. Um, and you'll see, like in a few years' time later on my CV, how um, working with, enjoying, like making yourself a good person to work with, 
um, even though it wasn't kind of directly working with him later on when he came to look for people that he wanted to help build out his team and when he joined Fidelity he thought I remember that guy from ITV who helped delete the tweet um, but also helped me make some good stuff while I was at ITV I wonder if he's interested in the job at Fidelity so between then um, I also went to work for Sky News um, and the picture that I've chosen uh, in the top left of this slide is me during a rehearsal for the 2016 US election that was rehearsing a scenario that the eagle-eyed among you will notice never happened of uh, Hillary Clinton winning that 2016 uh, election. So I was at Sky for two years and then um, got a message from Richard saying, got an interesting thing that I'm doing. Do you want to come help out? Um, and initially I was like, what's fidelity? What's asset management? Um, what's investment? Uh, and he convinced me that it was a really interesting thing to do. And actually, there's um, loads of transferable skills from journalism. Um, and really what we do in our team is find interesting stuff that goes on at the company and help to craft it into stories or pieces of content that other people will find interesting, which isn't all that different um, from what, what, what we would have done um, at a news TV station. The things that humans are interesting, interested in is uh, pretty universal. <laughs> Um, and quite often we find that in the investment team at Fidelity, like an analyst might have buried away on page 42 of their PDF some really interesting little nugget that um, those who are trained to spot stories go, hold on, this shouldn't be on page 42. This should be the first five seconds of an amazing video or something like that. Um, so those are the things that I'm really interested in make happening at Fidelity. Um, on my team, I uh, manage graphic designers, so people who make charts interesting, make infographics interesting, help edit photos, help edit um, brochureware, things like that. Producers who write scripts, come up with story ideas, um, make stuff happen basically from start to finish of a video or a podcast, whether that's getting access to somewhere we want to film or record getting time in people's diaries to make to bring people together, um, researching, briefing, helping in the edit. Um, editors are people who will um, get a load of material in that we've gathered and then turn it again into interesting content, um, maybe into loads of different formats, like we might have um, a retail audience who will watch something on LinkedIn and want 60 seconds of something really good. Uh, and we might have a bit more of a sophisticated professional audience who want a really in-depth discussion. Um, and equally, we might have a really sophisticated audience who just don't have time to watch an in-depth discussion, but needs something really smart distilling into something very short, but very impactful. Um, and we also have on our team, multi-skilled operators who um, have probably come from um, a broadcast or technical background um, and they help press the record button turn lights on, set lights up in a way that will light people flatteringly in the studio, um, less flatteringly if they don't like them secretly, um, make sure sound works properly, make sure everything looks really good and make sure Fidelity looks like the kind of premium package that we want our clients to think of us like. Our key stakeholders are our marketing sponsors. So our friends in different parts of the Fidelity world who will help get this content to the end users, whether that's on social media, um, in advertising campaigns, in marketing campaigns, or in kind of email communication with clients. Um, and then also the investment management team at Fidelity. So it's really important that my team has a good relationship with the people doing the kind of cutting edge investment research. Because as I kind of hinted at earlier, those are the people who've got the scoops um, and all the interesting stuff that we want the people, that we want the world to know about. We want them to think that the people at Fidelity are smart. I'm going to trust them to look after our money for us. Um, and a couple of good examples of stuff we've done recently are recently sent a camera person and a producer and an analyst into the Borneo jungle where we're helping a company monitor their um, impact on biodiversity in the Borneo jungle. So we've sponsored a project for them to put audio recording devices 
into different locations um, in the Borneo jungle. And then we use AI to analyze those recordings over the long term and tell us in this area, we, um, we detected 72 different species of, um, not gonna remember the word for the, the, specific, the specific animal. Uh, but, and then in somewhere else, we couldn't pick up as many, um, as many monkeys as we did in the other place. Um, so we've got really interesting footage of um, people going quite deep into the jungle in quite remote conditions, setting up complicated audio equipment, um, bringing it back to base, and then taking it all eventually to a lab in Marseille where they run this um, AI software and then deliver results back to investors. You can then make a score about how um, biodiverse this area is, uh, which then affects how likely they might be to um, invest in this company based on whether or not they're ruining the jungle, in short. Um, my typical day is not always the same, obviously, um, but we've got colleagues around the world, so we usually have a team meeting fairly early in the morning to make um, time for my colleagues in Hong Kong, Singapore. Um, this morning at 10 a.m., I had a project update to um, see how the Borneo content was going. So that's on videos, there's a written article. I'm really excited about a podcast we're making that uses the audio from all these recording devices we put in the jungle, editing it into something that's kind of cinematic and immersive. So we wanna say, close your eyes and imagine you're in the jungle and we've kind of got this 360 audio space of all the different species that we recorded. Um, uh, and um, using all that audio for video as well. Um, it's a bit more difficult to make, make it real with video because a lot of the species are quite kind of, you can't see them very clearly if it's different birds, um, different insects, stuff like that. So that's a bit more of a challenge. Um, this morning I also had yeah, an Outlook video edit review. So we've just published our annual Outlook, which tells investors and clients what we think is gonna happen next year. Um, so we had a load of content that goes to a load of different markets um again videos podcasts written material featuring all our kind of key investors um where they look ahead for the next year and tell us exactly how awful it's going to be um after this call i'm recording a podcast with um andrew McCaffrey, our cio who gives us a monthly update on his take on the world so we've um wrote the script for it yesterday which was updated um based on Trump running for re-election. Um, what does Andrew think about that? We're about to find out this afternoon. Um, just before this meeting, I had a call with someone from my internal comms team who wants to help um, uh, Fidelity employees get to know some of the, um, the, the more senior people at the company better. So how can we make some videos about them and a get to know you series? Um, Used to be that the series was like a load of quick fire questions, walking backwards. Someone like a producer had to walk backwards holding the camera, firing these questions at the boss, um, which is really difficult, uh, walking backwards and remembering questions, not falling over the curb behind you and looking good in front of like the most senior person at the company. So we're working on a, a slightly different concept for that. One thing I'm really keen to do, I think, um, and helping to show that the big dogs are real humans still, is going on like a hobby day with them. So if someone, um, Anne, our boss, uh, for example, loves gardening, so we might go and spend a morning with Anne gardening um, and just have a really kind of natural conversation with her. Maybe not all that much about work, but about what she gets up to and what drives her while she's in an environment that's really comfortable for her. Um, then at three, I did this. And then at four, as I said, um, we're going to record that podcast with um, Andrew, who's at home in Surrey, and then um, Richard Edgar, the editor-in-chief, who's at home, I think, in Brighton. So it'll be recorded over Zoom, but with we've sent microphones like this, a little Rode USB mic. Um, we've sent nice quality recording equipment to their houses um, to make sure we capture that in quality. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an example of um, our recording setup in the basement of our office in um, London. So on the left, um, that was a recording actually a couple of years ago. So that's what it looks like in the studio. And on the right, I'm going to talk you through some of those people and what they do. 
So the person right at the back on the right hand side of this, um, looking kind of concerned, is Raji, who wrote the script for this video. Uh, on the far left is Preeti, who was operating the auto queue, making sure everything ran to time. Just to um, Preeti's right is Alex Wilcox, um, who is a live studio director. He joined us from um, Bloomberg. But before that, he used to be, um, uh, he worked at Man City as the guy who like operated the, um, the in-stadium scoreboards. Uh, and would like flash up the big red card sign every time someone got sent off or made sure he pressed the goal animation at the right point, um, which is high pressure. And so good preparation for working at Fidelity. Um, and then I'm going to move on. Um, actually, no, I missed out me. I was in the middle there looking a bit worried, um, but uh, making sure that the whole thing made sense. Um, on the right hand, Side actually, no, I've moved slides. Okay, um, I'll keep it relatively brief. The things that we're looking for when we interview people are oh, I had a bit of feedback there. Um, uh, confidence, um, and uh, knowing the stuff that you're interested in and knowing why you're interested in it. So, quite often in interviews, we're looking for people who are interested in making stuff. And so I want to know what they like and I want to know why they like it. So if I ask, like, um, have you watched any good TV recently or listened to any good podcasts? Uh, and someone says, I don't know, really, actually. I think I watched a film a while ago. It's usually a bit of a red flag. Either they're not very interested in um, making stuff or they don't have much of a critical faculty to describe why. So I don't really mind what it is that people are into, but I want them to be able to um, explain why an idea is good and how they might use it for inspiration for something else. Um, and the second bit is we don't just want more of the same. We want people who are going to bring new ideas into the team um, who have really good ideas of maybe someone um, on YouTube who does something in a really interesting way and will help us attract a new audience or um, they've worked somewhere else that does something in an innovative new way using a different part, uh, different kind of technology. Um, so yeah, don't think you need to just make it sound like you're everyone else at Fidelity. Don't think you need to sound like you know everything there is about investment management, but um, primarily people we wanna work with need to be um, interesting and like nice. We wanna have a nice time working with them. Uh, over to you, Amy. Thank you, Stephen. Um, sorry, I think I've lost my camera just as I'm next to speaking. So, apologies about that and bad timing on that. Um, but yeah, if we just pop onto the next slide, I can speak to that. Um, so, yeah, I started off in the graduate scheme working in the digital and innovation team back in 2019 um, and then kind of moved around there doing different rotations. Um, and then kind of rolled off that into a full-time role, working as a project manager for workplace investing in the global thought leadership team, which I spoke about a little bit earlier on. Um, but I think that just highlights, and I think we've seen it on this call, kind of the ability that there are so many non-investment roles across Fidelity, and also that there's that ability to move horizontally throughout the company as well. So even when you come into one of those roles, that doesn't stop you from jumping around to different areas. Um, which is kind of what I and the others on this call have also done. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit more around kind of the grad scheme itself and what experience that taught me. Um, and I think the kind of main thing that I really got out of it was the rotational element of it. So moving around every kind of six, seven months or so into different areas of the team that I was in. And I think this really develops some kind of core skills where you're really having to learn very quickly to assimilate yourself into new teams and work with a really, really wide kind of range of individuals. And I think that's good in that it gives you the people skills to learn how to deal with different characters and also means you get to kind of learn off so many different people and see how they kind of interact day to day. I also think in terms of kind of just the work that you're doing and the challenges that you face, it means that you're just getting so much more kind of variety with that and when I think about how that impacts the role that I'm in currently I think it makes you a lot more of a kind of dynamic person moving forward so for example in our team I think we had kind of the last two years pretty planned and then 
COVID came along and we've had issues like the Russia-Ukraine conflict and kind of global economic issues and suddenly all the work that we had planned has had to really, really change pretty drastically and we have to kind of shape shift every day into what we're doing so it suits current trends. So I think that ability to kind of think on your feet and problem solve and change the course that you're planning to go is a really, really invaluable skill to learn. I think the other thing about the grad scheme that I found really, really beneficial was just the support that you get from the early careers team. So that can be in things like the lunch and learns that they put on, opportunities for mentoring, um, kind of training sessions, training days, that networking amongst your peers as well. So just getting to know the other grads, getting to know what areas they're working in and have that, having that kind of familiarity with what they're doing is good. And also just opportunities to get kind of qualifications and certificates. So I completed the investment management certification, which for me has been really beneficial both in, both in my past role and the role that I'm in now, because it just means that when I'm talking to people from that more kind of investment side or kind of project product side as Tanya works in, I have more of an idea of actually who they're targeting and what they're offering. Um, so yeah, I think those are kind of my key learnings from the grad scheme. It's a excellent scheme, whatever kind of area you go into and fidelity is a really really great place to work i've been very happy here so yeah with that i'll pass back to serena thank you very much that, and it's always nice to have a shout out to the early careers team i did not put that in speaker notes for her i promise um so i will wrap up and i will strongly encourage you guys to put some questions in the box or in the chat i've seen a few come through so i will ask them to the people on the call um but if you've got any more this is your chance to drop them in. Um, so just to wrap up quickly, you can see um, that despite the fact that Fidelity International is uh, an asset management firm, we have so many opportunities beyond investing uh, and you can access those through our early careers opportunities. Um, so through our business management and sales and marketing schemes uh, and the people that spoke today sometimes do have graduates and interns rotate into their departments. So it is not a million miles away from something that you could be doing and could be experiencing. Um, I obviously work in HR and an asset management firm, so it really is true that you can have a super varied career, um, picking up loads of different interesting projects that you might not have considered. And hopefully we've introduced a little bit of that to you today on the call. So just a reminder that applications are closing soon. So please do get your applications in if you would like to apply. We recommend you do that as soon as possible to give yourself time to do those assessments. And again, you don't need to be studying anything finance related. We welcome applicants from all degree disciplines. It's really about making the most of the experiences you have had uh, and the things you have learned, no matter what those are. Uh, and again, there's no grade requirements. Um, so I think it was James that said it, but just apply. If this is something that sounds interesting to you, don't underestimate yourself. Take the tips from the people on the call do your research. You are already far ahead of other people, either joining webinars like this live or for those of you that have jobs or lectures and couldn't join live, watching back the recording. You're already doing really well and, and really taking the initiative. As I said, you can email us on that email address at the bottom of the screen, early careers at fidelity at FIL, Phil. Dot com uh, and we can also give you access to recordings for all our other webinars if you want to learn more about investment management overall more about financial markets and get a really really deep dive on some of the business areas that have been introduced to you today um, but we thank you very very much for your interest in fidelity and if we take the slides down now i can facilitate a few questions um, before we finish up the call so this is one which I think is very relevant in post COVID times, which is, are there options for hybrid or remote working? And I think it'd be really nice for a couple of people to talk through their split of, of office and home and, and how they manage that. Um, I'm happy to go first. So um, I work four days a week actually. So I work part time um, and I split um, my week um, with two days in the office and actually one day usually in our Surrey office and one day in our London country office and then two days at home and our camp today. Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I can go next. Um, I mean, I think you can all see none of us are in an office, uh, which kind of half answers the question. Uh, but I mean, personally, I do 
it depends on the week uh depends what kind of meetings or events or whatever there is um normally two or three days in the office um that's just a personal choice the rest of my team will normally only be in uh, one day a week so we try just make sure we're all there on a thursday uh just that's kind of our day together to get some face time um but beyond that it's very flexible i just kind of like going into the office i know Tiny's worked here longer than I have, um, but you know I've worked here for six years in a range of different teams and met a lot of different people over that time. Um, so it's quite nice to be able to go into the office and just bump into people that you wouldn't normally speak to on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, kind of similar to James, actually. Um, I'm in two or three days a week. Um, we have team meeting on a Tuesday morning. We're trying to make sure everyone's in for... And then it's a bit different for the people on my team who operate physical um, kind of studio equipment. So they need to be in quite a lot more often. But it's definitely changed from before the pandemic when we were in five days a week to um, now we're kind of in when we need to be. So that's for meetings or if there's people we need to film, people we need to record, um, equipment we need to physically operate. But it's also kind of interesting that we've got quite a lot of remotely operated equipment now as well. So we also have a studio in Kronberg and a studio um, in Singapore that we can operate from either our bedrooms or from um, the London office, um, which is a big development in technology. Yeah, and I'm similar to the others, it's a real mix, um, kind of just dependent on whether I've got kind of meetings that I need to be in for. My team a bit more global, so people sit in America and Hong Kong, so obviously can't go in and see them, but can go in and interact with other people, got kind of big meetings to be in. Perfect. So to sum that up, yes, we do have, it's dynamic working at Fidelity. You will find that uh, a lot of organisations have their own word for, for hybrid or flexible working and ours is dynamic working. Um, but you can see that everyone on the call does something slightly different. I'm, I'm the same. Some weeks I go in four days a week because I've got face-to-face -face events and some days I go in once per week. Um, so it really is varied um, and I wouldn't let that stop you from applying if you're worried about having to be in the office all the time or perhaps being stuck at home all the time and not being able to see anyone you will get the opportunity to meet your team we've only got a couple of minutes left so uh, i'll ask this question which is what's your each of you's favorite part about the culture at fidelity that's a big question but if we could have a couple of you say maybe one thing that would be fantastic I'll go first. Um, I think it's probably one word, but I think like growth mindset in the sense that people are really, really willing and happy to push you forward and will try and kind of propel you to get to the best place in your career. Um, for me, it's just there's a lot of interesting people. There's so many different parts of the business um, and like people's jobs are to be in some cases like the biggest nerd in your field of like there are oil analysts and there are electric vehicle analysts and there are healthcare analysts and then there are specialists in um making stuff happen within the business and um like by the time they've been at fidelity for a little bit of time they know loads of interesting stuff and um it is really not all about um investing but there's so many things kind of indirectly affected by it They've just learned loads of interesting stuff. Great. Anyone else got anything they'd like to add on culture? Uh, I would just say, um, I mean, I don't know whether you would sum it up as kind of like it's people, um, but it's just uh, to Stephen's point, there's so much going on. Um, it's such a kind of very diverse global business. Um, that it's, it's impossible to know everything, to be honest. Um, and so there's always normally an expert somewhere in the world, um, or there's always somebody who will be able to answer your question. And it's just kind of being able to utilize your network in order to, to find those individuals. Um, and once you do, you know, everybody is pretty much always happy to give you the time of day in order to discuss feedback or an idea or, you know, get their insight into something or get them to look over whatever it may be. Um, so I suppose it's a combination of kind of uh, those two things, really, I suppose, for me. Brilliant. And Tanya, obviously, you love it so much that you've not left. So hopefully there's something culturally that you enjoy. 
<laughs> yeah, I've been here a long time, seen a lot of changes um, in the organisation. Um, but I think one thing that hasn't changed, I think as Jane touched on, is, is the people um, and the collaborative nature um, that we work in. Everyone is super helpful. Um, my one of my favourite sayings, every day is a school day. I learn something new every single day and I've been here a long time. Um, and I just love the variety um, that, that I'm able to see and experience every day. Um, and also the, the different types of people and, um, and the fact that we are really quite inclusive. Brilliant. And I think we're at a time, so I'm going to leave it at that. Um, but thank you all so much for joining. And for those of you who are going to watch back, we really do appreciate it. We have had one question, which is, does anyone mind if they connect with you on LinkedIn? So can I have a thumbs up from any of the, the speakers that are happy for a request? There we go. So, <laughs> so if you'd really like to, to learn a bit more about what people are doing, you can absolutely follow or connect with us on LinkedIn. Um, as Stephen will be aware we share lots of articles. If you follow us, I'm sure you'll find lots of articles and podcasts and videos um, that can help you learn a little bit more about what everyone's up to. Um, so huge thank you. Please do email us uh, at our shared inbox if you've got any further questions off the back of this or if you want recordings of any more of our webinars. We really do appreciate your interest in Fidelity. We hope you've seen that there are opportunities beyond investment management uh, and we hope that you'll put in an application soon. Goodbye. Cheers.